night. We'll turn now to Proverbs. Uh, if you want to open your Bibles to Proverbs 20, uh, we'll find our main passage there in Proverbs 20. Um, but as we have been doing in this series, we'll bring in other Proverbs and even other scriptures. So this morning, the theme is guidance and discernment. And I want to begin by uh, sharing with, um, by sharing some of what I shared with our Salisaw graduates recently. I had the privilege to address them uh, in the baccalaureate service. And uh, there I tackled the question, what is God's will for my life? Uh, which is a very relevant topic to, uh, to this theme of guidance and discernment. Uh, this is a major question that not only graduates face, but uh, people in various seasons of life. And so I said to them that evening that uh, perhaps, perhaps they feared being like Joe. As Joe made certain decisions that would set the trajectory of his life, well, he prayed, but maybe not as hard as he should have. And he tried to discern what God would have him do, uh, but something got lost in translation. You see, Joe was supposed to be an engineer living in Dallas, married to a woman named Sue. But instead, he ended up being a math teacher in Tulsa, and he married some woman named Kathy. And then, because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, he gets hit by a bus, and he stands before God, and God says to him, Joe, why didn't you follow the path that I had planned for you? That might be a fear that, especially young people, again, as they make these Choices that set the trajectory of their life. But even, even uh, all of us here this morning, as we make decisions in life, maybe we sometimes have that fear. Like, okay, maybe I'm rock, walking down the wrong path. It's good for us to seek guidance from God. But I have some good news. We don't need to fear being like Joe, because that's not quite how it works. Right? It's, it's not as though God has some secret that he's keeping from us and that uh, if we don't discern that secret perfectly, then uh, we're going to be totally in the wrong place at the wrong time, that we're going to have the, the complete wrong trajectory in life. It doesn't quite work that way. Fulfilling God's will for your life, it's, it's not about cracking some kind of code. In fact, Scripture tells us precisely what God's will is for us. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, This is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, first and foremost, what, God, what God's will is for us. That we are sanctified, that we are made holy, that we become like Jesus, that we follow after Jesus. Now, this topic of God's will, it can be a little tricky because uh, there are different facets to it. Um, the Bible seems to speak of God's will in two ways, and this is historically how it's been divided. There's God's revealed will, and then there is God's secret will. Okay, So God's revealed will is just what I shared with you, right? Your sanctification, or really all of Scripture, right? This is what God has revealed to us. Uh, God, God shares with us in His Word how we can uh, come uh, to reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ, right? It shares us the gospel, and it shares how we can walk in uh, the gospel, how we can become more and more like Christ, how we can follow after Him. That is God's revealed will. Okay? And then God's secret will, well, it's... it's all that he has in store for us in the future. Right? Maybe what job you're going to take or if you're going to move here or there and so on. Or even the small, I mean, we make, we make hundreds of decisions every single day, right? And Have you ever heard of the butterfly effect? Right? One little tiny decision you might make is like a butterfly flaps its wings on one side of the earth and then it totally changes the tra trajectory of events on the other side of the earth. Right? There's these chain reactions. And so really it's not even just these huge decisions we make. Every little decision we make could have some kind of effect on our lives that is, uh, is huge. Right? Which again can make us think, oh man, I can really mess things up. But one of the themes this morning is that God is sovereign. We can trust in him. We don't have to be paranoid about that. All right, there's what he's revealed to us. That's what we need to focus on first and foremost, what he's revealed to us following after Jesus. And we trust him with his secret will, which is also called his sovereign will. Now, we participate in kind of walking forward into God's secret will, uh, but we need to rest assured that God guides us by his sovereign hand. 
And he doesn't always do it the way that we would like. You know, it can be tempting for us to seek after some divine revelation, uh, to look for signs in the clouds, as it were. I mean, I remember doing this, especially as a younger person, like, like always, always wanting God to give me some kind of sign. Um, but we call this God's secret will for a reason. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of his law. You understand what that's saying? Saying, hey, let God take care of the secret things. You focus on what he has revealed. You walk in what he has revealed. And so, again, I'm, I'm still kind of giving my summary of, of what I shared with those students uh, in the baccalaureate service as we uh, asked this question, what is God's will for my life? But this uh, really fits in well with our theme this morning of guidance and discernment. So it's important that we don't seek signs while our Bible collects dust in the corner. That's kind, of, that's kind of the whole message here, right? As we think about, okay, how do I get guidance from God? How, I, how do I discern what God's will is for my life or, or what I'm to do with my life? Well, don't, don't be looking for signs in the clouds or, or even uh, through other things, but while your Bible is collecting dust in the corner. But again, first and foremost, we must look to his word, to what he has revealed but, of course, we all, we all feel this. Maybe, maybe you're asking the question right now, yes, but God's word doesn't tell us exactly what to do in every single situation that we face. Right? It, it may tell us, you know, thou shalt not do such and such. It might give us some moral principles and, and ways that we are to live our lives to the glory of God. But it doesn't tell me whether I should take this job or not, or whether I should do this or whether I should do that. So what do we do then? And that's kind of what we're going to hone in on, right? Um, how can we participate in um, moving forward and being guided by God's sovereign hand? How can we seek guidance and discernment? And, and the things and the decisions that we have to make that are not directly addressed in Scripture. And so the core verses that will structure um, the sermon this morning are, are uh, Proverbs 19. I think I said that would be in chapter 20, but I, I meant to say 19. Proverbs 19, uh, verses 20 through 21. And so let's go ahead and read that. Would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? Proverbs 19, verses 20 through 21. Short couple of passages, but again, we'll look at uh, some others as well. Listen to advice and accept instruction, that you may gain wisdom in the future. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Let's pray. God, as we look at these verses and as we look at others, as we consider um, how we are to seek guidance and discernment, I pray, Lord, that you would give us insight through your word, through your revealed will, and help us to know how to apply it. Uh, even in the most difficult of situations. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so four points this morning, which is a couple more than I usually have, so we'll, we'll, go, we'll go fast. Uh, seek godly wisdoms, number one. Number two, make godly plans. Number three, trust God's sovereignty. And then number four, take action. So first, seek godly wisdom, right? How are we to... Uh, Seek after guidance and discernment. Well, first we seek godly wisdom. And verse 20 tells us one way we can do that. Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Listen to advice and accept instruction. Google is not the primary way we ought to do this. Google can be helpful, but I don't think that's what, of course, Solomon didn't know anything about Google, but even if he did... I don't think that's what he's getting at here. How are we to listen to advice and accept instruction? Well, this is one reason why God has given us the church, right? so that we can counsel one another when we face tough decisions. This is one way that we can seek godly wisdom. We seek it from one another through godly people in our lives. This is all too rare today in our individualistic age 
But imagine a church body um, in which we trusted and respected and relied on one another so much that we just came naturally to seek counsel when facing difficult choices. That we would listen to advice, that we'd accept instruction from one another. Which that applies even now, as, as, as I preach this, that you would accept this instruction, that you would listen. But even as we, in a Sunday school class or on a Wednesday night or just out in the foyer or, or, or even just in our day-to-day life, as we live life together as a church, that we would come to one another and that we would seek and offer godly counsel. So that's one way to seek godly wisdom. Uh, the two other primary ways are Scripture and prayer. Right? Scripture and prayer. Of course, it is to the Scriptures that we're looking right now as we seek to answer the question, how can we seek godly wisdom? Right? The Scriptures are telling us, well, one way you can do that is by accepting counsel from one another. But, of course, the Scriptures themselves are a place of wisdom for us. Right? I mean, this whole series through the Proverbs, right? we, we, are, we are seeing all kinds of profound wisdom that is given to us. And so we look to the scriptures for not only the how, but but for the what. We find wisdom within the scriptures. It shapes us. Not only the Proverbs, but all of scripture. And then finally, prayer. Prayer is key to seeking wisdom. It is through prayer that we express our desires and make our requests known to God. And then ultimately, Lay it down at his feet. We say, not my will, but yours, just as Jesus said in the garden. Through prayer, we ask God to guide us by his spirit and to open and to close doors and to work behind the scenes in ways that we will never know this side of heaven. And so all these things, godly counsel, scripture reading, prayer, uh, these together work to renew our minds so that we may come to wise, godly decisions. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Right, so this speaks to the renewing of our minds, which again comes through this godly counsel, through Scripture, through prayer. And it says that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, it's important that we see that discerning the will of God here, it's not receiving some kind of new revelation. Again, that's, uh, there's what he has revealed and there is what is secret. The secret things belong to the Lord. So it's not the secret will of God that we discussed earlier. Rather, it's being able to test and discern what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Right? And so this discerning the will of God, I think, is essentially the application of the revealed will of God. Because, as I said before, we all know that the Bible doesn't tell us what to do in every single situation. But it does shape us. It does give us wisdom. So that through the revealed will of God, and yes, through God's Spirit working within us, we can apply that in such a way that we are able to discern what is good and acceptable and perfect We apply it to these unique, complex situations. Okay, So that's the first thing is uh, seek godly wisdom. Number two, as we walk forward in life, as we we seek to live in accordance with God's will, as we seek guidance and discernment, well, after we seek godly wisdom, we make godly plans. Verse 21. Many are the plans in the mind of the man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Now, at first glance, if we just read verse 21, it might seem that our plans are pointless, right? Like, okay, many are the plans of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. No doubt this speaks to the absolute sovereignty and immutability of God's will. That is that God is sovereign and he has a will that does not change. But it's not fatalistic. And what I mean by that is we shouldn't read verse 21 and say, Oh, well, God's in control. God's purposes will stand. And so I guess there's nothing for me to do. That's not the point of verse 21. The Bible as a whole won't allow that. 
And even if we just consider the verse right before that we just went over. Well, let's just look back again at verse 20. It says, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Well, what would be the point of listening to advice and instruction and gaining wisdom for the future? What would be the point in that if none of it even mattered? If it's like, oh, God's going to do what he's going to do. There's some mystery here. And I'll talk about that here in just more in just a moment. But, but understand that, yes, even though verse 21 is very strongly um, putting forth God's sovereignty before us, it does not mean that our plans are pointless. In fact, uh, we, we ought to make plans. We ought to make godly plans, and we ought to seek wisdom in order to do so. There is a mystery to it all, right? There's a mystery to how God's sovereignty and human responsibility work together. Certainly a big part of that mystery or an answer to that mystery is that God uses means, right? I don't claim to be able to get to the bottom of it at all, right? There, there's, there's a tension that we just have to accept and say like, okay, it's, it's far beyond my puny human mind to understand how God can be absolutely sovereign and yet I'm responsible to make meaningful choices. It's true. It's hard to piece that together, but one, one, one way that helps us to do that at least a little bit is to understand that God uses means, right? That God is sovereign, but he's, he doesn't just zap everything, like zoop, zoop, like, but he actually uses our prayers. He uses our plans. He uses the things that we set out to do. Yes, while God sometimes works in spite of our plans, it pleases him to work in and through them. Proverbs 16.3, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. It pleases God to work in and through our plans. Consider also James 4.13-16. through 16. This says quite a lot about plans and the sovereignty of God. James 4.13-16. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year and trade and make profit Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. What such boasting? Well, it's not, it's not making plans, period, but it's making plans with no respect to the sovereign will of God. Right, oftentimes you might hear people say, maybe you say it yourself, you might say, Lord willing, I'm going to go do this or I'm going to do that. Well, that's taken from this passage, right? It's saying that we, we ought to always recognize that God is the one who's in control. And so we don't make our plans as if we are the commanders of our own destiny. I'm going to go and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. No, we say, if the Lord wills, because if the Lord doesn't will it, it's not going to happen, right? Now, again, there's, uh, this gets back to these... Um, two different wills of God, right? There's the revealed will of God, which often is broken, right? I mean, the Ten Commandments, people break the Ten Commandments all the time, right? And so in one sense, we can say, yes, there are times when God's will is not fulfilled. Anytime we sin, his will is not fulfilled. And yet, and yet, even in and through our sin, God's sovereign will is accomplished, I mean, think about Jesus' crucifixion, the worst sin ever to take place. In the book of Acts, it tells us that it was by his sovereign decree that Jesus was crucified at the hands of lawless men. They were held responsible for their sin, and yet this was something that God had planned before the foundation of the world. There's a great mystery to it, but understand, there's, there's a sovereign will. It's going to happen because God is God. And so... When we make our plans, we remember that, hey, God's the one that's in control, not me. Which leads us to the third point, trust God's sovereignty. Yes, we make plans, we, we seek to make good, wise, godly plans, but ultimately we must trust in God's sovereignty. And so again, verse 21, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. There are many other Proverbs that say essentially the same thing. Uh, for example, Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of a man plans his way, 
but the Lord establishes his steps. And so when we read this in the context of everything we just discussed, this is a great comfort, right? A comfort that, hey, okay, I don't have to worry about being Joe, right? That if I take one misstep, that all of a sudden everything's going to unravel. Because God is in control. God establishes my steps. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Now, this does not mean that we shouldn't make plans, that we have no human responsibility. But it does mean that we can relax a little bit. We can trust that when we're utterly clueless, that God is working in our heart in ways that we can't even detect, that he establishes our steps. Another proverb, Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Right? God can turn the heart of kings. And so he can and he does turn the heart of, of you and me. And so there might be times when God turns our heart in one way or another, we don't even know it. We think, oh yeah, it was me. Maybe there are some times we can detect it, other times we can't. We have to trust that God is working, yes, in so many ways that we can see, but in so many more ways that we can't see. More than that, he's working in a million different ways, not just in our hearts and in the hearts of others, but just in opening and closing doors, working behind the scenes, uh, setting our path before us in ways that we will never know, at least on this side of heaven. Ephesians 1.11 tells us that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. And so again, this is his secret will or the sovereign will of God because it will come to pass, right? He works all things according to this will. And so we trust him. We trust him. Again, I'm the first to admit that I don't fully understand how all of this fits together because uh, what, what, I, what I'm seeking to weave together here is that, yes, while God is absolutely sovereign, that, yes, we should seek wisdom. We should make godly plans. Like, like uh, we have a responsibility. The Bible, if it's clear on anything at all, it's clear on both of these things, which may be hard for us to fit together, but both of these things are absolutely true, that God is sovereign, that he's in control, and yet... We are responsible to seek wisdom, to make wise choices. So whenever we hold those two together, I think it really can empower us. And it can comfort us. That God's got us. There's a mystery, but again, a part part of that answer is that he uses means. That he uses our prayers, that he uses our plans and so on. And so our seeking of wisdom, the plans that we make and act upon, they're all kind of folded into God's sovereign plan. Again, even in our sin, what man intends for evil, God intends for good. So I already kind of jumped ahead. I gave the example of Jesus' crucifixion. But also, do you remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament? Right, His brothers... um, at first, they were going to kill him, but then they uh, choose to sell him into slavery. Uh, still a very wicked thing. And yet, that was part of God's plan for Joseph to uh, remember he was, uh, he was a servant of, of uh, someone who was high in command. And uh, after this whole roller coaster of events, he actually ends up um, being at a place of great authority in Egypt. So that when there's a famine and the people of Israel come to Egypt, uh, he actually is able to preserve them through the, through the um, actions that he had taken as far as you know, storing up food and all that. Um, and so he's able to preserve the people of Israel, but then also that sets the scene for uh, the people's bondage in Egypt and, and then their exodus from Egypt, uh, which uh, is uh, so, it's, it's such a hinge point of the story of redemption and, 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 you know, that story of the Exodus points us to the gospel. But all this to say that, you know, just thinking about not only the story of Jesus, but the story of Joseph and so many others, we see that someone might do a very wicked thing that they intend for evil, but God intends it for good. And it's not that he's just making lemonade out of lemons. It's not just a reactionary thing, but God is sovereign over it all. He knows the beginning and the end, and he has 
planned things to work according to his will. So again, there's a mystery here. While he holds us responsible for our sin, right, things that go against his revealed will, he is nonetheless sovereign over it, and it is part of his secret or his sovereign will. And so we can trust in him even when it's hard to understand. And so when it comes to difficult decisions, right, just bringing it back to the real practical here, right, whenever we face decisions in life, plans that may affect the whole trajectory of our lives. I think it's helpful for us maybe just to pray a prayer like this, to say, God, I have, I've sought godly wisdom, sought counsel from others, I've looked to your word, I've prayed. God, I've sought to make godly plans, but I know that your ways are higher than mine, that, that there are things that I cannot see from my limited perspective. So, God, if my plans are not in the best interest of your glory and my good, please thwart my plans and guide me in your path. And guess what? He will. He will. The whole point of that is, yes, we, we do what we're called to do in order to make wise choices. But in the end, if, 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 we, if we do what, what, what Scripture tells us to do, if we focus on that, what God has revealed to us and what we are to do, if, if we focus on that and then we just... Uh, trust it to God, man, how, how, again, how empowering and comforting that can be. Because if you trust that God really is sovereign, uh, that he is working in and through all things, then, then you can trust that he's not going to let you totally mess it up, right? And so you say, God, I've, I've done all that I can. I've, I've sought guidance. I've sought what I should do. So now as I move forward, God, if this, if this isn't your path for me, then stop it. And again, he will. So that leads us to number four, which is that walking forward, right? That, 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 we, that we are to take action. We are to be people of action. And so I'm going to close on this point, and, and it will be brief. Sometimes when people misunderstand the nature of God's will and how he guides us, uh, they can fall into a trap, uh, just as I said at the very beginning of the sermon, uh, seeking after signs or some kind of absolute certainty, Right? Um, they, 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 want, they want to know more than what the Scriptures promise us. Right? They, want to, they, they want to peek into God's secret will. They, they, want, they want God to reveal more than He has revealed. I say they. I can be guilty of it as well. And when, when we have this kind of misunderstanding and we approach God's will in this way, it can be easy to fall into a trap. And it usually goes one, one of two ways. There are some, so, so let's just think of a hypothetical situation, okay? You, um, you have a tough decision to make. And you really feel like, okay, this decision is going to affect the trajectory of my life, so I want to get this right. So you pray, you do those things that, you're, that, that you ought to do, but you still don't know for sure. Here's what happens sometimes. Sometimes I think people will develop a kind of manufactured confidence. Have you ever heard someone say, oh, well, God told me to do this or that? Now, let me say, I, I don't doubt that God can and does guide us by his spirit. That's part of this whole equation here. But sometimes, I think we've probably all seen this before, maybe, maybe have been guilty of it. There's, there's, there's such a desire for certainty. Again, you kind of start trying to read Read signs in the clouds. Oh, look, God has he's pointed me in this direction. God has given me a sign. God has told me. And that can give us some comfort, right? Okay, yeah, God has told me absolutely what to do, so now I'm going to do it. That might give some confidence, but it's kind of a dangerous confidence. And it can be dangerous. It can be dangerous to attribute things to God that he didn't actually say, right? That's why we have the revealed will of God. This is what we know for sure what God has said. We need to focus on this and, uh, and, and be very careful about, um, you know, saying God told me to do this or told me to do that through some kind of sign. So that can be very dangerous. So that's one trap that some might fall into if they kind of take this wrong approach, this wrong understanding of the will of God. The second is maybe some people get paralyzed because they're so afraid of stepping out of God's will, right? They, they, they say, okay, God, I'm not going to do anything until you tell me what to do. 
And they pray and they pray and they pray. And maybe, unlike the other, maybe they don't manufacture something, but instead they're just waiting. They're just waiting. And, and, and they think, okay, God's got to tell me exactly what to do before I do it. But the scriptures don't, scriptures don't put it to us like that. Kevin DeYoung uh, has a little book. It's called Just Do Something. I think the title alone is helpful. As Christians, um, yes, we are to seek guidance from God. And yes, we are, in a sense, to follow the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. We recognize that God's Spirit does work, again, often in ways that we can't even detect. So yes, we seek after those things. We trust in those things. We trust that God is sovereignly leading us forward. But we shouldn't expect or demand more than what God has promised us. God has not promised to tell us what we should do in every single situation. He wants us to seek wisdom from his word. He wants us to pray and then just do something. Just do something. And trust that God is sovereign and that he's going to, he'll guide us, again, even in ways that we can't see. He'll open and close doors. He'll stop us in our tracks if he needs to. If you're seeking godly wisdom and making godly plans in accordance with God's revealed will, then we can have a confidence and a comfort that all will be well, that God is working all things together for our good. Right? Just as we quoted together, as we were uh, read from uh, Romans 8 in our responsive reading, that he works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So God is sovereign, and he will work in and through all that you do. And from time to time, in spite of it, right? Sometimes God does work in spite of what we do, in spite of our plans. And that hurts a little bit, <laughs> right? Some people got to learn the hard way. But even in that, God has a purpose. God even has a purpose in working through our failures, The secret things belong to the Lord. But that's not meant to make us gun shy. It is to make us trust him as we boldly live for his glory. And so, in these Proverbs, we've seen, I think there are three, four different Proverbs I read that that very clearly stated, you know, God establishes our steps. God turns our hearts. It's God's purposes that will stand. God is sovereign. We can trust in that. And yet also these Proverbs and throughout all of Scripture we see that there are these ways that we are to cooperate and, and, and that, that we are to seek wisdom so that God can be pleased to work in accordance with our godly plans. And it's all folded in in some mysterious way into God's sovereign will. So, seek godly wisdom. Make godly plans. Trust God's sovereignty and take action. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this wisdom from your word. It's so helpful even though uh, there are things that are so beyond us. Help us to not get caught up in those weeds, but for us just to trust in your word that it's true. Help us to embrace Maybe the tension, not not contradiction, but the tension that we see with your sovereignty and our responsibility and and how your purposes and our plans are are all um, woven together in this story. Help us to trust you, Lord. Help us to live for your glory. We thank you for the wisdom that's in your word. We thank you for Jesus wisdom incarnate. Thank you for um, all that he taught and showed us in his life, but most importantly for his death and resurrection for our sins. We know that Jesus is our only hope. And so may we trust in Jesus first and foremost. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.